Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another photo mishmash. This one being broadcast live November 4th, 2020. And I'm just so glad everybody could tear themselves away from the election news for just a few moments to join us, to, to have a welcome distraction about photography. We've got a packed show. We've got a service that aims to use artificial intelligence to figure out which pictures you've shot are the ones to keep. So, you know, we all go out, we shoot thousands of photos and we get back and we feel overwhelmed by that. Is this the future of photography, a letting a machine pick our winners? We also wanna talk about Canon firmware updates, two new Canon lenses. And of course, we're gonna be reviewing your photos and Lightroom tips and tricks. I wanna share a little bit more of the new Photoshop updates. So a lot to do. And I'm really happy to welcome back to the show, Crystal Weir, who is joining us today from Atlanta, Georgia. Both our guests, not to spoil our next guest too, is coming to us from Georgia today, which has been in the news a little bit. But Crystal, how are you? I'm good, how are you doing? Good, I'm doing really good. Happy Thanks to so be much here. for joining us. Yeah. Yeah. And as I said, our other guest, David Carr, is joining us as well, professional photographer in the Atlanta area. David, how are you? Good, man. I'm doing well. Uh, the weather's amazing here in Georgia, regardless of anything else. <laughs> so, <laughs> that is nice to hear. You yeah. guys had you had you had the storm last weekend, was it? We did. Uh, Crystal, did it hit you? Where uh, you not, were? not too bad. Okay. Yeah, we got hit. I it, it was in the middle of the night. I didn't. You know, I kind of just was like, whatever, we're going to get some wind. But uh, power went out, came back on, went out, came, and then it went out for like 14 hours. So, um, which, you know, boohoo, some people deal with that, you know, for days. But um, still, that was probably the longest power outage I've been through. So it was definitely like, come on, <laughs> come on, 21st century, kick back in. So You realize very quickly how limited we feel when, you know, everything runs dry and we're out of out of power well, for all of our fun little yeah. places. Yeah. And all of our, and our cell phones didn't work either. Like the cell towers were down or something. So oh, like from my house, I had no way to communicate with anyone, wow. which was kind of nice. Um, yeah. But at the yeah. same time, it gets old. And then our, our Wi-Fi or, well, the internet was out for like four days after that. So oh, wow. I'm just finally getting back into uh, modern living. So Yeah, that's tough. Yeah. That is tough. It's um, all right. <laughs> it, you know, yeah. And of course, as I said at the opening of the show, there's the, the election going on. So maybe next year I will, you know, separate my house from the internet and all power for a couple of days or go out <laughs> to the woods because it's a great idea. Well, the one thing, you know, the one thing that I'm realizing from this is after you do your part in voting, you mm -hmm. don't have any other control. So mm -hmm. to yeah. like watch the numbers go up and down and watch this newscaster say this is going to happen and that's going to happen, it doesn't do anything except, at least for me, make me more anxious. Exactly. So, I know. Okay. Yeah. Every four years. So, and, you know, I, I, I've i seen very little. Usually I feel like there's some really good photography that comes out of election night, but I think a combination of the pandemic and just mm -hmm. the strangeness of it all, I haven't even seen some good photo galleries of, like, you know, people waiting with bated breath and That's a good or, point. And or celebrating or any of that stuff. Yeah, it's so, a good point. Yeah. It's uh, it's a, just such a different way to do it. But uh, everything this year has been flipped upside down. So, yeah, um, yeah. But we will. Get I, I voted for my Boba Fett mug. That's what I voted for. Well, of course. I mean, that's uh, yeah, I, I would have voted for that as well. <laughs> yeah. And I want to take a moment to welcome our chat room in with us as well. Thank you all for watching and taking a break. Uh, for wherever you are. And I see David McKay is in there uh, from McKay Photography Academy, of course, and saying hello from, uh, I think he said Nevada. So David wanted to take himself out. Uh, he wanted to be in a, a more of a kind of a, a hot zone like you guys are in Georgia. Uh, so that's why. Mm -hmm. no, yeah, that's definitely. Like he's, yeah. He's, doing some, um, he's doing some cool stuff. You should share a little bit about what you're up to, David, um, as part of that trip. Yeah, and of yeah. course, Roy, thank you for hanging out in the chat room as well. Uh, Roy is watching the chat for your questions that we'll answer over the course of the show. And if we don't get to them during the show, at the very end of the show, we uh, have all of the questions collected and we'll do a rapid fire answers of anything that you want there. So uh, again, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. Hope you're all doing well. And, and recognize that this is an international show. That, so there are people outside the U.S., which, you know, I mm. think... Uh, in, in talking to some people today, I think outside the U.S., they're like, how does your system work again? Yeah, I think it? so. <laughs> it's very confusing for a lot of people. Yeah. And uh, very, I mean, we are yeah. a very unique country in that way. So, yeah. 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 All right. So uh, let's dive in. 
Crystal, we're going to talk to you with your acute, adorable youngest on your lap um, a little bit about you. We kind of chat at the beginning of the show. What folks have been up to. You uh, were involved in a photo shoot for L.L. Bean. I'd love to know a little bit more about that. I'll share the kind of the cool picture that the little uh, graphic. But tell us a little bit about how how that happened and and uh, what you got out of it. OK, um, so a rep from Zappos actually contacted me through email and um, asked me if I'd be um, interested in being a part of the Zappos and L.L. Bean collaboration launch. And so, of course, I mean, that was like the perfect thing for me. And she said that, you know, just include me and my family. So that was, you know, easy <laughs> to do. And so um, we just had like a, it, it was like a very seamless process. Um, I think the way they reached out to me, I'm not sure exactly how they got to, got like um, my name, but um, I have worked with L.L. Bean through Hike It Baby before. Um, so not directly with L.L. Bean, but um, they're like sponsor, they sponsor this organization called Hike It Baby. And um, I like photographed their shirts and their hats before. Right. So I'm thinking L.L. Bean maybe put my, passed my name to Zappos. And that's how they um, got in contact with me. And um, they wanted to send me all these products and they gave me like the shot list and all that stuff. So they really walked me through the process of Great. what they wanted. So that made it very um, easy for me too. Cause there was like a two week turnaround, I think. And I had to work around my husband's schedule and my kid's schedule, of course. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. it was, it was pretty seamless and we enjoyed it and we got to keep the clothes. So that's a bonus too. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. That cool. Congratulations. Was on there, that. If, if you don't mind me asking, was there, uh, was there money exchanged too, or just yeah. product? Yeah, there was money exchanged too. They asked me my uh, rate and I, gave them my rate and they accepted awesome. it. So that was great. Yeah. Win, win, win. That's awesome. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and when we're, we've got this, this, uh, these shots here, um, uh, pulled up, um, mm -hmm. the one on the right you're in. So, right. uh, who, who yeah. photographed uh, My husband photographed that one actually. He's pretty, pretty he's... good. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I've got him a he few did... things here. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> That's yeah, and great. my son actually job. photographed the shoes, the shoes on the left. My son actually photographed that photo. Oh, that's great. Nice. Yeah. yeah. That's, that was, really was family affair. That's awesome. Right, it was. Yeah. That's really wonderful. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we enjoyed I think it's, I mean, um, so you mentioned uh, being involved with Hike It Baby. Yes. How did you get involved with that? Um, when I moved to Colorado, um, that was the first time I've ever been anywhere with mountains. So I needed, so I was kind of like, I wasn't uh, familiar with being like outdoorsy like that. And so um, I found the group through Facebook and it was just a bunch of um, uh, families. They get out with their little ones to mm -hmm. have, like show them like, you know, different ways to adventure and explore. And so that was right up my alley because I had two little ones and um, it made it easy for me to um, learn about um, the outdoors and safety and all that kind of stuff. And so I started photographing for them in 2016, I believe. And I still do it um, to this day. It's yeah. wonderful. Cool. Yeah. That's cool. I was really curious because uh, as a as myself, as a YouTuber, um, I'm often reached out to and I often signed up for some of the services. So I think mm -hmm. people who who are hobbyist photographers always are kind of interested yeah. in different mm -hmm. ways that they can mm -hmm. make money with mm -hmm. their photography. Um, and sometimes people are happy with just shooting for free uh, right. product. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's the, the pros and cons to that, mm -hmm. though, the whole mm -hmm. like kind of exposure. And right. we're actually talking about this in my uh, Zion workshop about uh, Best Buy had reached out to me a couple weeks ago. Hmm. Uh, I should say they tagged an image of mine mm -hmm. on Instagram. It's, it's nothing too special. And they said, hey, we'd love to use this, you know, reply hashtag yes, Best Buy or something like that too and mm -hmm. i said no thanks because mm -hmm. all they want is to then just share that and exactly. somebody on the trip was like hey well that's really cool exposure and i'm like you know mm -hmm. it's it is i don't want to dismiss it but at the same time what would it actually translate to right me, right you know as a, as a gain mm -hmm. um, that's a good and, that's a good question too I, i've i've uh i've had a lot of people say that over the years oh well think of all the exposure you could get if you do this it's like, yeah, is that really going to like put me on the map though? That exposure. I mean, I mm -hmm. think it's great to have exposure and get paid and, mm -hmm. you know, win, win. And, and yeah. sometimes you do a little compromising, but I do think people use that, yeah. that, oh, think of all the exposure you'll, you, you'll get. They use that a little too frivolously. Mm -hmm. There are so many photographers that the chance of any of us like becoming like 
a big star in it, it are pretty slim. Mm-hmm. So you gotta you gotta take what you know, you gotta grab what you can when you can. And, mm-hmm. and I don't mean in a greedy sense, but like our work should be compensated for, you know? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, in some of the services I'm signed up for, like I think um, uh, Muse Town is one. So anybody out there who wants to be an influencer, you can go out and you can sign up Muse Town. That's M-U-S-E-T-O-W-N. Um, but most and they email me uh, like a couple times a week. Um, these are broadcast emails, not to me specifically and say, hey, here's a campaign you might be interested in. And they often are deliverables like a couple of Instagram pictures, a couple of Instagram stories. Usually that's it. And the um, the the payment is usually just the product. Like, mm-hmm. hey, you get to keep the six pack of Patagonia Cerveza beer. I'm like, you know, mm-hmm. it's really not worth my time. Right. Um, every once in a while, there there are you know like, hey, a hundred and twenty five dollar gift card. Which again, if you're a hobbyist and occasional, uh, yeah. You know, that, that could be cool. A couple of those a year and maybe you could fund a new lens. But mm-hmm. if you're really trying to make a living at this, ooh, you're not getting anywhere anytime soon. Right. Um, at least not not with the kind of Instagram numbers I have. Maybe when you hit 100,000, 200,000, then, then you could start to actually mm-hmm. make some money off of that. Mm, right. Yeah, maybe so. Yeah. So, Crystal, I'm really here. It was kind of, the, the you know, having that social aspect, working with an organization and then getting your name passed along. Right. Um, so it's it's kind of that age old, like it's it's who you know and who you've mm-hmm. worked with and then word of mouth of saying, hey, this person did a great job for us. Exactly. Um, and, and I imagine some of that Hike It Baby stuff was just, um, you probably didn't get paid early on. So no, not argument, early on. No. Yeah, yeah, so no, you can't no, make no. the argument that in, in those kind of specific cases, a bit of exposure can lead mm-hmm. to something down the road. Um, yeah, I've serious. actually had, there have been shoots mm-hmm. that I've done where maybe like it's a corporate gig or something. And I did one actually a few weeks ago uh, for uh, basically Universal Studios and um, uh, I can't remember why I just drew a blank on the uh, the hotel chain, but it's a it's a nice luxury hotel chain. And they were doing an event in Atlanta at this pumpkin patch farm thing for like a corn maze thing. They were just doing an event. And they were like, look, we need a photographer. We we do not have a budget to pay you, but we do have a lot of high-end clients that will be coming to this. And so I was like, well, okay, I'm not doing anything else that night. I, I might as well go do this, shake some hands. And sometimes I'll just chalk that up as experience and practice, like getting better at doing those types of events. Um, but, you know, I, the hope is that I would start getting enough business that I don't have time to do practice shoots Mm -hmm. for free but there are times when i'm like well i'm not doing anything else and it would be a great chance for me to get out and 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 you know work with my lights get better Mm -hmm. at doing that and hobnob a little bit and see who i might run into and i made some uh some good acquaintances at at that at that gig so it was i think it was worth it for me so i think especially if you're starting out it's uh it's a good um, avenue to like, you know, just like you said, like work on the, on your craft. So yeah. that's how I really started. Like I, I um, photographed for Hike It Baby and I feel like it made me um, learn my camera better, learn like how to use my lenses better. And so it, it, it really has helped me like improve in what I, I do. So it can be um, a benefit. Too. Sure. Um, and I didn't say this. I think Henry uh, put, put the banners up at the beginning, though. Um, Crystal and uh, David Carr, thank you so much for joining us, of course. And you can follow them, all of their social media. So if you want to see more of Crystal's pictures besides just those LLB ones we showed, her Instagram and her website are right down below. Um, and David Carr as well, along with your YouTube channel, too, David Carr, which we, we're waiting. More stuff. I know. I'm, I, you know, if, if I could stop fixing everything that breaks in my house. Um, we had a big water leak the other day, so... I just yeah. immersed in that now. So yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry it wasn't to a, deal with that, but <laughs> impressed how quickly I saw you like tearing away wet drywall and then like four stories later, there's new drywall up. I'm like, yeah. Like, I get to it. Me. I get to it, man, because I mean it was a mess and it was it smelled bad and like mm. the dishwasher is, you know, a little tiny little piece fails and you know water just ruins things. Um it just does. Uh, so it's, it's the your home's worst enemy. So yeah. Yeah, but I will get back my... to the YouTube channel. I promise. Cool. Cool. We're looking forward to it. 
All right. Um, what else do I want to talk about? You know, I didn't put this in the show notes, but I just I put out a video last week on which drone I think is you should be considering, kind of the pros and cons of all the kind of major drones on the market this year. Um, and the opening, I have three dr drones that kind of rise up into the air in front of me as I'm as I'm talking. I'm pretty proud of it. Uh, not only did I spend forty dollars on uh, a object tracking plug-in for Final Cut Pro. So if you hmm. watch it, you see the little names of each drones kind of stick to the drone in the video. That's how oh, that's cool. done. Um, and it was it was really easy the way that that plug-in works. Um, but because of the timing um, of, of creating that and uh, the weather, my kids weren't available. So I used the neighbor's um, kid to launch the drones at the beginning of that shot because Chris was actually filming it. Since I've lost cause, I haven't replaced him since I'm not doing quite as many videos as usual. Um, and sure. so, you know, Crystal, this is, this is like your son doing, uh, you know, sh shooting the, the, the boots in the picture. Mm -hmm. uh, this eight-year-old did a fantastic job. I mean, he launched each drone at the precise moment it needed to be. Each drone mm -hmm. needed to be launched a slightly different way because mm -hmm. of the different apps that each of them uses. And man, he just handled it all. I was it's just, awesome. I was like, that's, that's great. That's he probably great. had a good time too. Yeah, yeah. he did. He did. <laughs> um, and then I did make the mistake of letting his sister fly the littlest one for a moment and wasn't really paying, she's closer to six. And um, yeah, it went, the Mavic Mini, which is sitting, I don't know where I put it, over there somewhere. It went straight into a tree. Um, cool. And oh, it no. was caught at the very top of that tree. I thought, oh boy, I had to climb it. And then the eight year old had to hand me the longest stick we could find. And then I had to just kind of bash it out of the tree. Good news is, um, unlike Adi's drone, who if you're a pen member, you saw Adi's poor story this week of her husband misjudging his piloting skills. Yes, I saw that. Crashing hers. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, even after I bashed it out of the tree with a stick and literally just kind of like trying to whack near it to get it to mm -hmm. fall down it was ready to fly instantly again the props probably should be replaced they're they're nicked but it still flies that's amazing so, that's great um you know i these days these these drones are are pretty tough i'm not going to spoil that review i want you to go watch it i'm pretty proud of it i think it's good um but I'll just say cool. that we are i think a day away from the Mavic Mini 2 being officially announced. Um, I had enough specs in that video, leaked specs to talk about it knowledgeably. There's a couple more that have come out since then that don't really change my opinion, but I've added those to the uh, the website that supports it down below. So you can go take a look at that. Cool. Also, I don't know if it what it looks like I'm doing. I'm petting my dog who is desperate to come up. Oh. So let's just bring him up for a moment. Hey, what, is buddy. everybody ignoring you upstairs? What's happening? Why do you need to be down here? <laughs> Yes. I feel like so, I need somebody oh, here. I, I'm... <laughs> yeah, David Carr, you're you're uh, you're all alone there. Let me go get the bunny or one of the chickens <laughs> or one of the cats or the dog or the lizard. Oh my you, goodness. You, yeah, you've got a good collection there. Yes, Dr. Doolittle here. Uh, one other thing I want to mention before we move on is that the uh, Fuji a XA7 is on, they're calling it Epic Deal today on Amazon. Um, and it's, it's fairly tempting, um, I think. It is a $450 camera. Uh, it's, it's usually, what, uh, about $700, uh, somewhere around $700. Let me find my screen share so that we can look at this for a moment and talk knowledgeably about it. Sorry, here we go. Um, there we go. Uh, so, fully articulating screen, nice 24 megapixel APS-C sensor. This is an interchangeable lens camera. Comes in a couple of different snazzy colors. Cool. Uh, of course, good old black and the, the black and silver. If you are a Fuji shooter and you want a small camera to carry around with you, this is a great deal. If you're looking to get into the Fuji system, this is a very good deal. The only thing... That, I, that hesitate for me to say this is a must buy is the fact that it does not have a viewfinder. Mm. It is, uh, you know, back of the camera screen only, which that can be limiting in, sure. you know, brighter light. Let me ask you about uh, both of you. I'll start with you, Crystal. Mm. Um, you, you got a mirrorless camera, you have the R5. Uh, and now that you have a mirrorless camera, there's no difference in autofocus system from back of the camera to the viewfinder. Mm -hmm. Do you find yourself still using the viewfinder as much as you did on a DSLR or do you use the back of the camera some too now? Um, I do use the, um, well, I use both. Um, 
I do have, I do see myself using the um, live view a lot though. Um, mm -hmm. I just, I don't know, I'm used to it because when I have my Mark IV, I use it all the time. So I'm just used to Did using, okay. yeah, sure. using the okay. live view. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 How about you, Carr? Yeah, it, well, I never even like considered that that would be something I would use a lot more uh, on a mirrorless camera because I didn't use live view very much with like the D850 or the, the D5. I, I could have, but I just didn't think to. And I always liked to look through the viewfinder. But there are a lot of situations now um, if I'm shooting really, really low, um, you know, I did uh, some some sports photos for the school that my boys go to last week. I did some uh, volleyball team photos, and I got really low and had dramatic light and and a wide angle. And you know, I'm not gonna I'm not going to get all the way down on the ground and, and look through the viewfinder. I love that I can mm -hmm. do that and move the screen and and still get a really great idea of what the shot's gonna look like. So mm -hmm. yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, for, for myself, I think I definitely use the viewfinder more just to make sure people know, you know, when you're shooting with a DSLR live view or the, the screen on the back of the camera uses a different focus system. And usually it's noticeably slower mm -hmm. than your autofocus system through the viewfinder. Right. In the mirrorless, there's absolutely no difference. They are identical. Um, that's not to say one's better than the other as far as because there's other pros and cons to them, kind of like we're saying. But I well, definitely find myself... Yeah, well, yeah. and you know, one thing I've I've noticed, is, yeah. I mean, sometimes I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very slow learner with with things I should have probably known a year ago. But um, with the, the Z cameras, you know, you can switch uh, the view mode so that the back of the screen never lights up in, unless you're just reviewing images or it never lights up at all, um, which will save battery life. And I just it didn't occur to me till very recently that I should just put it in basically prior prioritize the viewfinder. And really only use the back of the screen when I need it um, or, you know, when I'm reviewing an image mm -hmm. because, you know, that, that just eats through those batteries. The thing's constantly switching back and forth. And, and so it's one of those things I think people who are hesitant about getting into mirrorless or they want to get into it, but they're not really sure what, you know, what, what the difference is going to be. That is definitely a big difference and just something mm -hmm. that takes a little getting used to. But again, I think it's just one of those things that only makes the experience better and, and we're able to refine the experience all the more because we have that tool at our disposal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you know, interesting fact. It, it depends some on the camera, but most of these modern mirrorless, the viewfinder actually will eat up a bit more battery than the LCD on the back. I've heard that. Okay, yeah. Just because they are higher resolution often, mm -hmm. and even though that's a tiny little screen compared to the you know the, the screen in here compared to this, apparently that draws a little bit more. How much it depends on the camera, I think. Sure. And I don't think it's a huge difference, but people are talking about it. So yeah, I've, so I've definitely heard that. Yeah, so have I. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's dive into the part of the show where we look at some images in Lightroom that you all submitted in and uh, chat about them for a few minutes. And just a reminder, if you haven't watched the show in a bit, we, um, we're trying to do this a little faster um, so that we uh, don't spend... I always say that. And then yeah. every show, when I go back in and I put the table of contents in, I'm like, we spent 40 minutes reviewing pictures. <laughs> well, I have a great idea, Toby. Why don't we just, you bring the image up and we just say merit or <laughs> does not merit and then just move on. It's not a bad idea. Not bad. Um, All right. No, we want to give a little bit more feedback than that, but we are going to try to keep it a little bit lighter. Sure. Um, make sure we got time for the rest of the show. First, before we get to this, this was not sent in for Mishmash, but I wanted to talk about this. Um, uh, Juan reached out to me on Instagram. This is just to let you know, I get stumped from time to time. He reached out to me on Instagram and said, hey, I got all of these pictures where when I look at the JPEG previews, I have like this guy is not cut off, but the raw, it's cut off. And I'm mm -hmm. like, hey, you know, just go to the crop mode because here's what happens. In the camera, if you shoot at a aspect ratio other than the sensor, like you choose 16 by 9 or something right. like that, it'll crop. But when you go to Lightroom, the rest of it's there, usually. But in Juan's case, from his 5D Mark III, it's not. The JPEG preview shows if we go and say, hey, hmm. show this in Finder. So, or explore. This is where you go find the actual image. And if I do a quick space bar, there it is. Mm. All of that dude. But if we look at the picture, the raw, he's yeah. cut off. Interesting. What? Why? I have no idea. I, I spent strange. about 15, 20 minutes searching, figuring out. And 
I don't know. I put it in DXO for <laughs> the new one. It shows all of it, but when you edit, it actually acts like the JPEG. It doesn't act like the raw. So I really <laughs> don't know how Juan ended up like this. That's strange. That is strange. So That's interesting. I don't... if anybody's watching and they're like, oh, I know why, let me know so I can let Juan <laughs> know. Because we don't. I don't have an answer for that. So, <laughs> all right. First up, though, let's take a moment and look at Pam Case's black and white flower. Oh. And I know I, for Crystal and David, it's always a little difficult to, to make really good judgments on clarity and, and sharpness coming because you're watching over YouTube, basically. Um, and I'll just say that there's a lot to love about this image, Pam, but the flower is not sharp. It is just a little soft. Mm -hmm. I can't quite tell where focus is the sharpest. Your, your shutter speed looks good. Your aperture is pretty good. Um, but... Yeah. It, hmm. it almost looks like it's just focused maybe on part of this leaf above the flower, something mm. like that. Yeah, it's hard to tell looking at it from here, like you said. I mean, I, I like the initial impact and the composition, I think is mm -hmm. great. I, um, there's, you know, I like the, the, you, the, the brightest thing in the, in the image is the flower. But yeah, if, if it's not sharp, I wonder if there's another shot that you have, uh, Pam, that, that maybe is a little sharper, that you could kind of give it the same treatment. Um, yeah. but that's a tough one. I mean, sometimes yeah. you don't know it until you put it on the computer and you're like, oh, wow, it's, it, it's actually not tack sharp. Mm. Yep. Um, and uh, let's go back to, um, Tanya's, uh, macro tips last week, even though this isn't really a macro, if you weren't on a tripod, I really think a tripod could benefit you because yeah. just that little bit of movement back and forth, your depth of field here is pretty shallow as we can see how nicely the background gets soft. Mm -hmm. So you want to watch out for that. All right, we're going to move on. We got uh, Teresa's uh, lighthouse somewhere. Teresa lives somewhere around here, I think, somewhere in my neck of the woods out in the Washington area. Hmm. And there's there's quite a few lighthouses out here that look like this. I'm not sure which one this is, though. Hmm. Yeah, well, I have. If you don't know, then I have zero. <laughs> um, I like the so, drama of the sky. Yeah, yeah. the sky looks and great. I just feel like the blacks are really um clipped i don't know if that's my end or but. nope okay that's 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 the exactly the first thing that i noticed and i, I mean i think you could say this is personal preference to mm -hmm. a degree mm -hmm. but i but because of the size of this is probably what caught your eye crystal mm -hmm. the, the tree it's just a solid black blob yeah and it becomes kind of distracting all I'd right. love to see a little bit of information in there and I, we're work we got a uh, teresa sent in a jpeg so even if we bring the shadows up well, ah, hey, hey, I, look, a little bit of information comes out of there. It's interesting how much still looks like it's down, but let's bring it up just a little bit more. And now we have hints of a tree there. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just kind of, you know, it was clearly a tree before, but right. now we, we got detail in it. Yeah. Yeah, that looks I, better. And I would probably mm -hmm. come up from the bottom a, a little bit on that crop too. I feel like there's a lot of stuff happening in the foreground with all the mm -hmm. logs and the, you know, mm -hmm. and it's not that it's bad. I just think it, it was putting the horizon kind of almost in the middle or the, the, it, especially the lighthouse was kind of like right in the middle. Yeah. Um, I feel like yeah. somewhere in there could be tighter. Yeah. Yeah. And what about coming in from the left? Any mm -hmm. thoughts on that? I was kind of thinking that. Yeah. It's good. You, go you know, way. well, it's hard to say. Cause I mean, it just depends on how much of the scene, um, she wanted to show but like the the lighthouse is clearly the subject and but you have this tree that's kind of competing for that because mm -hmm. it's large so i think the more you can hone in on the lighthouse perhaps it makes it a better or a stronger image um but uh, to crystal's point i mean the sky is really beautiful and you know that's that's the kind of skies we want with our mm -hmm. photos and so again that was a reason i was thinking of cropping up and and just it's tough sometimes with an image like this. There's so many little points that are great, but you just want to make sure you're able to bring the viewer's attention to the main thing, even if they have to make a few stops along the way at some other cool spots. I just think it's, mm -hmm. you really have to play with your cropping a lot in a situation like this. Yeah, yeah. Last thing I say, uh, two, two quick things. One, Teresa, I noticed a little bit of a, it looks like a brush stroke ended up here in the sky. Hmm. Um, so you want to watch out for errant brush strokes. And two is our, our horizon, 
um, the tree line here intersects almost perfectly with kind of this roof line of the lighthouse. And it's not a big deal, but it's one of those things where I think I'd like the lighthouse to more firmly break that. Mm -hmm. So getting a little bit lower should raise that up into the sky. Um, or if there was a way for you to get a little bit higher and kind of frame it within that line. There's no, I don't think you could get high enough to frame the, the very top of that. I, I don't, wouldn't want that because I like this part of it being broken free. So sure. I might be being a little too picky there. Well, it's, it's some of these things, if, if I can just say, I, you know, sometimes we're looking at images and we're saying, well, if you were to go shoot it again, this is what you, this is what I would say to do. And then sometimes we're looking at the image and saying, OK, well, given that this is what you have, let's talk about how we can edit this to get it to the best place possible. And so I've had to be careful sometimes when I'm critiquing an image to to think like, OK, well, they're not going back to reshoot this anytime soon. Or maybe they are. But this is the image we have now what can we what can we do with what we have but it's a great point i think finding where those intersecting lines are that's a very important uh, part of composition mm -hmm. yeah all right all right Teresa. thank you uh we're gonna move on to uh chris he uh attended my zion workshop uh, a couple weekends ago hmm. and i'll say this right up front and then crystal and david you can weigh in this looks this is a very cool composition but it looks a little okay. too HDR for my personal taste. Hmm. I was going to say um, that. Yeah, you feel the same, Crystal. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Now, I'll say that, you know, in the Narrows, um, you have from the bottom, it is very dark to, you know, you have bits of the sky showing up above. That is a huge dynamic range. And if you want to get all of it in a single shot, you do need to do some exposure bracketing and sandwiching those shots together, almost always. Sure. Um, or, I mean, you can you can do it in one shot, but you're going to push it so far that I think it starts to look, look like this. And I don't know what it is exactly that I can put my finger on to say, but there's a quality to these walls here that feel, I guess, maybe overprocessed would be a way to say it. Yeah, I think I could agree with that. I mean, and sometimes that's personal preference, but mm -hmm. I, I think there's there's a fine line when it comes to giving something that HDR kind of treatment. And mm -hmm. I was gung ho about it, you know, when I started in photography and then I've had to dial it back a little, there are times that I'll still kind of throw a hint of it in. Um, but it's just, I don't know. It's, it's one of those, like, it's really cool that we can do it, mm -hmm. but you have to like, I don't know. I think you just have to consider context and, and, and kind of also what is, I don't want to say what's trending in photography because it's not always about chasing trends, but sometimes things have been so overdone that you just, you know, just take that into consideration when you're, when you're processing. Yeah. I feel like you may have wanted to like, just bring out all that texture and it just went just a little too far maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I mean, and there, there, the, you know, the fantastic thing about being in the Narrows is all of the texture going on in the rocks. But I think you take it right up to that point, for me personally, and it sounds like you guys are on the same page, to, to the point where uh, maybe you, you, you're you using HDR techniques, but it doesn't look like an yeah. HDR. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Com Composition-wise, any thoughts? Hmm. I, I, I mean, I, 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 I it's pretty... Yeah, I was... Just going to say, I think if you came up from the bottom, you, you, yeah. it gets yeah. really beautiful in the middle, you know, with the the, mm -hmm. the, the orange colors and all that. So, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm torn a little bit because I do. I like a bit of the leading water. I think you could make arguments for either either way. Sure. Uh, but we do have just this other little bit of funky rock here. that's mm -hmm. just, you know, lumpy and nothing else is lumpy. And so there's part of me, since it's only a small amount of it. It just kind of wants to come in yeah perhaps a little bit thinking about using this line from that right corner sure yeah yeah looks good cool yeah all right chris thank you uh we already looked at, at the um wands and then we've got lynn she sent in a jpeg and a dng i'm not sure there's any well the dng is the one that she edited and uh what do you all think about this very pretty yeah yeah really really nice i mean the, the 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 moment you captured here with these two swans and their heads together and it looks to me like both are keeping an eye on you Lynn. Um, 
you know, checking you out, which we, we've got that eye contact. Yeah, I really love the moment. That's, mm -hmm. I, there's like a flow to it. You know, this is one of those, I, if this is my image, I would, I would probably start experimenting with a way to really, I mean, it would almost go to an artistic place of um, really, really f bringing all the attention to the swans and and mm -hmm. like you can actually go in and in photoshop and you can really darken the water in a way that still looks beautiful and it almost mm -hmm. looks like you this this just ray of light hit these two swans and it kind of didn't hit anything else and i mean it, you have to get kind of creative with that but just to be able to really hone in on that that's one thing i would probably try to do but at the same time it's a great little moment i just mm -hmm. feel like it maybe just needs uh I don't know if it needs like a vignette or something to just sort of darken the water a touch or maybe a radial gradient or something. Mm -hmm. But it's probably what I'm what I'm envisioning is probably a, a little more heavy lifting in Photoshop or uh, yeah. if, does it, is, am I making sense? I don't know. Like, I, mm -hmm. I feel like the water could be darker. Yeah. So, yeah. Channeling David McKay and a little bit of painting with light or painting with darkness, maybe. Yeah. Would be a way to That's kind of what I'm thinking. In. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's say, oh, you got a brush. Uh, what'd you do with this brush, Lynn? You, uh, oh, you did already drop the exposure and the highlight some. I think we, we're going to use that brush and just kind of continue that process and really mm -hmm. get in there all the way around. And, and Photoshop would be a great way to do this because what you could do is, um, edit one layer and then do the masking to let it show through to the layer below. Yeah. 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 Um, Lynn, the one other thing that I could notice here with the higher quality view I have is that we have cropped in a good bit. So we're getting to a, a fairly small image and we are starting to see some noise. So even though it's shot at ISO 100, um, it looks like we've just this little bit of color noise starting to show up in the neck um, of the swan. I have to say though, I love the light in the wings and how we look at this histogram and you've got it all captured in there. There's no, there's no highlights blown out. But I would try taking a new brush and uh, maybe whites up and noise reduction and maybe saturation down and just see that little bit of kind of color that I can see in here if you can um, get rid of some of that. Yeah. And the other thing you might want to try to do is down in the color HSL panel. Uh, let's just close that for a second. I didn't see it moving too much. So you've got a, you, the green is what I'm seeing. You could drop the green saturation or raise the green luminance and see if you can wash it out a little bit there. Kind of see that come and go as I move that back and forth. And you could play with the yellow as well and see if you can clean that up just a bit. Cool. All right. Yeah. Um, cool moment. Let's let's stay in in Lightroom, um, and let me ask you. Let's see, we're on the screen. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you, David. We'll start with you. Sure. You shoot weddings, shooting a couple thousand pictures. Yeah. How much fun do you have figuring out which ones are the keepers and which ones are the ones you need to get rid of? Oh gosh, it can be really really tedious. I just had to do that with uh, you know, basically five days of school photos. Um, it was three shooting days and then two. Um, uh, to make up and uh, retake days. And so it, it was a lot of images and it's it, the, the culling process is, is not easy, especially trying to find like the best of the best. Cause sometimes two will look so similar and I'll sit there, I'll get hung up for five minutes on between two images, trying to decide which one's better. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah. Crystal, how much time is, does that suck away from your day of culling um, and figuring out the good ones? I tend to keep almost every photo because I shoot mostly my, my kids. So it's like every photo is like, I want to sure. keep them all. <laughs> so yeah. it's hard for me yeah, to I call. So I have too many photos. On yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm bringing this up because Kodak, Kodak out of the blue <laughs> has released this software that you pay them 30 bucks a month. You upload your images to their server. They'll go through and they will pick the ones that are good out of it. So it's an interesting idea. Hmm. And for me, I, I want to test it out. So give me a sec here. I got to get back to the, um, I went back to 2015, um, a wedding I shot in 2015. I was a second shooter and I just 
grabbed one of these. I'm, it's a little embarrassing. I definitely, it's not my best work. Where did it go? That's all right. Uh, a, here it goes. A&L wedding. So it's about 577 pictures, uh, and they're slowly coming up. And um, very slowly. I really have felt like this week it is time for a new machine. And uh. I don't know, again, Crystal and David, you both have updated to the latest Lightroom. Has it felt noticeably slower for you or not really any different? It does seem a bit slower. Like when I first um, updated it, it was it was moving pretty good. Then all of a sudden it started mm. lagging. So I don't know what, mm. what happened. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I, I really feel like mine <clears throat> is, is slower. And I am running it on an older machine. I mean, this is now a, a 20... 15 late 2015 mac um, yeah it it kind of comes and goes for me the 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 speed of lightroom and photoshop i mean well photoshop's always pretty quick but i will say i mean i've got this imac pro that you know i paid a fortune for last year and um it's mm -hmm. funny because it's it's super fast but it's also i get the spinning beach ball every now and then and mm -hmm. i get the laggy stuff which i don't think is my computer i think it's just something about lightroom and and just the way it's all reading it and and it's really frustrating because I'm like, <laughs> I just bought this computer and it's it's I'm getting a beach ball. I shouldn't be getting a beach ball. Right. You want it to be screaming fast, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, David, do you notice much difference between your Z6 shots and Z7 <laughs> shots when you're going through and culling and, and picking and things like yes. that? Is there, yeah. Yes, and the loading, the 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 uploading, and um, and just scrolling through, you know, just going from one photo to the next. Mm -hmm. um, it. It takes a second. I mean, it, when I was tethering for the for the school photos a couple weeks ago, um, I was grateful that the tethering worked flawlessly the entire time. But man, it took. You know, I would let the image pop up and people could see, and then I could they could go, "Oh, I like that," or "No, let me do another one." But man, it would it was taking some time for those things to pop up and then get sharp. You know, it's just they're big yeah. files. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, and you know, we got these rumors uh, from everybody, Canon, Nikon, and Sony, of all releasing big megapixel cameras next year yeah uh, is lightroom prepared for this i don't think, uh, so. I don't think so yeah <laughs> um all right so i i briefly <laughs> went through this this wedding i had never called these images because i i was the second shooter i just had handed them off so I, I briefly went through earlier today and picked some images out of it that i thought were were pretty good you know out of 500 images um i think a typical keeper rate for me at a wedding would be about 10 percent the deliverables probably would be less than that, but about mm -hmm. 10%. Yeah. That's uh, and I also uploaded them to this Kodak Professional Select system that runs through and told it that I wanted um, it to find 50 images out of it. And you can adjust that number. As you see over here on the right, here are the event preferences. You can set the priority, contrast, color, sharpness, face importance. Um, and then it goes through, it looked at all 577 pictures, and it said it found basically 47 unique ones worth sharing. And then it kind of puts these into these groups over here. And I just, I'm just really curious. It costs $30 a month or $300 up front for, the, for a year. Is this something that you think is interesting to either of you? Hmm. Um, I mean, I think it would be helpful, but I think I'm too much of a control freak mm -hmm. over my yeah. photos to let it actually take over. <laughs> I, I would agree with that. I mean, that's how I am with like presets, even mm -hmm. um, like Lightroom presets. I just, you know, I've played around with a few of them, but I always end up going back to like, I want to do it the way I, I want to do it. And mm -hmm. um, I do use like the auto button a lot, uh, Toby, like you do, you know, for the, mm -hmm. for the uh, tonality and all that. But um but yeah, I, there's certain things I don't want automated. There's certain things. I mean, I would rather take the time. And I will say, the more you, uh, the, the, the further you journey into photography, hopefully the more keeper shots you get mm -hmm. and the fewer duds and terrible shots. And, you know, just switching to mirrorless changed a lot of that for me mm -hmm. because now I can kind of see that's going to be way too dark. I don't even have to look at the meter to know it, you know? And so I, I love that I'm not shooting as many duds. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't mean I don't still have them, but at a wedding, it's not so much duds. It's, you know, it's just, you're just, the, no matter what any wedding photographer says, there's a little bit of spraying and praying because you're, this is, you've got this one chance to capture it. So you're just going to end up with a ton of photos. And you, the thing is like, I will say the culling process, 
it, it it's painstaking on the front end, but once you really get through it and nail down, like these are the shots, then you can begin kind of the fun work of really fine tuning those images. But, um, it's just, yeah. it's just one of the things you have to do. Yeah. 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 I, I, I agree with both of you. I, sorry. I, I, re I thought I was sharing my screen a few moments ago when I was talking okay. about it, but yeah. now I am. Um, so here are the ones that, that, uh, you know, a quick selection that I made groom getting ready, waiting for the first look, um, you know, m mother of the groom, um, some cute eye contact as they get in their boutonnieres on. This little flower girl, of course, very cute. Um, this cat getting a lot of love. Um, and first dance. And so then we switch over to the Kodak Select. And as I said, I asked it to find 50. Um, and, you know, interestingly, okay, this shot, sure. But what, what is this shot? I don't even know why I took that. Um, hmm. I, and um, then we got one of the same shots here. And these, I know I have better ones of the, I think it was the father of the groom. Hmm. Um, and, you know, he's kind of got an awkward, like he was in the middle of talking for both of these. So hmm. what you can do then is you can go to one of these. And I think it's slow. You should be able to, no. There's a way to then say, show me the ones around this to pick. I see, yeah. But for instance, Flower Girl, I missed focus. I grabbed focus on her basket here in mm. both of these. So it picked this one, but it, it recognized that there's this one, which is, I think, a good bit better. We got an arm coming out of her head back there. So actually, maybe this one is better. Sure. But disappointing uh, choices that it made here mm. um, in this kind of process. Um, and, you know, like back to somebody i would i would think that it would recognize that this is just the back of somebody's head and not clearly the <laughs> primary photographer so um and then this is the groom and the bride and she is you know making an awkward face there i'm pretty sure i've got a better one if we went and looked so it this hmm. is obviously version one or maybe we shouldn't even call it version one although they released it and they're charging 30 dollars a month for it um, it's not something that I think is, is ready yet, but sure. the idea down the road is neat. I, I, what I suspect we'll see at some point is some of this functionality built into Lightroom itself. Yeah, um, I could see that. In a way for, for Lightroom to kind of like flag or tag and say, here, here are the ones we think are best. And so as you well, can, it, it, yeah. And it's interesting cause I just today was going through the school photos and, and really working on the culling and I wanted to see, I, I did, I did class photos as well. So, you know, they're kind of mixed in with some of the individual student photos and I, I wanted to be able to just like search for group, group shots, like just, just put that in, like find a group shot and put them all together. And I was like, I was about to, I was like, wait, let me, let me just search group shots. And I was like, wait, it's not going to know to do that. Like it just, I, and then I thought, well, it, that would be cool if it did, you know, mm -hmm. then I could just like isolate those much more easily. And um, so maybe this is sort of in that realm of possibility uh, in the future. I mean, we're yes. already able to type in, you know, search for everything that has mountains and they show up, you know, it's like pretty incredible um, mm -hmm. how some of this AI is working, but yeah. you know, as we saw with the IPC judging and any kind of image reviewing and competition for AI to be able to pick up on what makes it great. Mm -hmm. it, there's a human element there. That's like mm -hmm. deep within, it's almost like within your soul when you see an image that I just don't, I don't know that AI is going to be prepared for that anytime soon. Um, yeah. It might be able to find focus in like, you know, yeah. Oh, here's a, here's a face that's in focus. I'm sure it can do that, but, to find the one that has the most emotion mm -hmm. or just the, the, just that sweet moment out of the other five shots that are similar. I don't, I don't yep. know. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I think we're, we're a long way from that. And also the fact that, you know, in this case, at least it, it knew this little flower girl was, was shots worth pulling out, but the one it ultimately chose was the one where her face is really out of focus. Yeah. So, Sure. It definitely has some some learning to go. I love that idea, though, of, of kind of the search being built in where you could say search for the group shots and then quickly pull those all apart. I mean, it was yeah. ages ago that they added the people, the face detection. Right. Um, but that right. is very that's not useful. I don't, yeah. Do you use the face detection? In I, I tried to use it like maybe a couple years ago, but I did not stick to it. 
Yeah. I did yeah. find it. Yeah. I couldn't get into that. Yeah, um, I don't. I mean, I think, and, and that's that's bad, Crystal. If you're not using it, because you, your subjects are your kids mm -hmm. primarily, mm -hmm. and um, you know, if it's not working for you, it's certainly not going to work for David, your wedding photographer, where you got different faces all the time. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I remember it was bad, and it, and it hasn't gotten any updates. I should say, I think it got one or two updates not too long after it was mm -hmm. released, but they haven't said anything about it in ages. Mm -hmm. And it would be nice to see a little bit smarter of those AI functionality built into that. Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, uh, you know, let me, we, we, you mentioned this, I think on the show and um, the, the Photoshop update. So let me come back into Photoshop for a second. Sure. And that is under the um, neural network. I don't have any image to show, but I just want to show folks where these new filters are. They're under filter neural filters. And, um, mm -hmm. oh, I need a selection. Do I have any images worth opening? Here, let's do this real quick. Let's come over here. Let's get this little flower girl and uh, open that up in Photoshop. And I also saw on the chat, um, a fair number of you were saying your Lightroom is feeling on the slow side again. So you might just try to make me feel better, um, but <laughs> it does feel like we're in this phase of, you know, it's just kind of this peak and valley of yeah. Photoshop's releases. Yeah. And we're in this one. This I love this story. shot, by the way. Oh, thank you. So yeah, filter neural filters. And this brings up this panel here that, um, we'll skip the tour. You've got skin smoothing and style transfer. And David, you said you used skin smoothing on some of the uh, teen portraits you were doing last week? Yeah, I actually used it on, it was a, four little children that, that the, the parents wanted me to photograph them together, some cousins, and, um, and I was, about to like be finished and I, and I saw that this was a, a new thing and I was like, oh, I'm gonna just try that on a couple of these faces. And I really liked the way it turned out. Um, I ended up create, you know, creating a new layer and um, using the neural filter on that layer just on the face. Well, it, it automatically sees the face um, and smooths the skin, but then you can fine tune it uh, as you can see there on the, on the sliders on the right. And then, um, and then that layer, I would pull the opacity up and down and just try to find the sweet spot where it didn't look too processed, but it definitely mm -hmm. looked more sort of angelic. I mean, these kids were little and cute and, you know, I wanted them to have that sort of like dreamy look without it looking too processed, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so it definitely looks useful. And then we've got this <clears throat> wacky style transfer, which these kind of filters have been around for a while but they are supposed to be much much smarter now mm -hmm. um and so those are those are two that are here completely working but then you've got this little lab function these are the beta filters a little lab beak and you've got the the smart portrait um which is uh you turn it on and you can do things like adjust the amount of happiness in the child. <laughs> so if we drag this to the right, we should see some change in kind of the smile of the, the child. And it's a little slow because it's sending this, uh, you know, a smaller version of this image to the cloud and doing the processing in the cloud, not on your computer and then sending it back. Hmm. It seems stuck. I don't know. Uh, Crystal, have you played with these? I haven't. I don't know if I knew about this update. I'm not sure. I, I, I thought be. that it I had heard people mention the beta part okay. of it and thought it was a whole separate, like you had to sign up okay. for the Photoshop beta, okay. but nope, it's in the latest update of Photoshop. Okay. You just go to neural filters and then you click the little beaker icon. Yeah. Um, it's, it's definitely uh, very slow. Well, let's see if we can make her yeah. Angry. One thing that's cool too, is you can, um, it'll kind of apply this filter all over the face of like smooth skin smoothing, but you can actually go back and erase it like off the mouth, off mm -hmm. the eyes. And it really gives that that sharpness to those features of the face. It mm -hmm. it takes a, takes it away so that it doesn't look processed. It, it looks like you just used a skin smoothing brush, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. it's kind of nice. Cool. Yeah. Yep. Oh, look! Here's there's anger. Wow. Um, so it just it totally manipulated her mouth from a smile into. I think that's more surprise than anger, but um, I think it would be hard to make her face angry. <laughs> um, <laughs> Let's let's try. There's there's it's normal. So these are fun if you're if you're bored, folks, and you've got the latest version of Photoshop, you can go yeah. out there and and play with these. All of the ones that mark beta are available. They uh, you just have to kind of download them when you switch it on. It will go download it if it didn't already. 
Um, and then you can see the ones that are coming. So this photo restoration one is going to allow you to, um, as it says, remove noise, adjust clarity, contrast, and really designed to improve this. And I also thought it was going to add color, too. I thought there was ability to add color. Any of these that really speak to you, you can say, I'm interested. You put in your email, and I guess they're going to add you to a list that says they might give you early access to them when they are you know, more publicly available as well. So that's, yeah. I just wanted to take a moment to show that. I did throw in a picture that had, you, you could see the little blue box around her face. If you put up a picture with more than one person, you will have a choice here in this yes. drop down between which person you want to work on. I, oh. Yeah, I, I had I had to figure that out because I was doing one photo. There were, there were two kids and um, I, I just put the, I adjusted the blur and, and all of that. And I thought it was adjusting it on both faces. Then I realized, oh, wait, actually, no, you got to click which box you want but to me like this this is just the beginning i think it's going to be a really great tool i mean photoshop is such an amazing uh program to begin with that mm -hmm. it this is all you know they're not going to release stuff that's just really subpar into it they're gonna they're gonna fine tune this and you know to be a, a quite a time saver for people who need to just do some basic skin smoothing and um, I'm not sure about ch changing the gestures on the face. I think I'm I'm a little torn on that. Even though sometimes I will tweak things a little with a liquify uh, tool, but right, yeah, yeah. It's cool yeah, and stuff. Kristen there. asked in chat, you know, how is this different than liquify? Which is, as you just mentioned, David, you could already do. But I mean, liquify, it's up to you to kind of manipulate these adjustments. In this, it's checking a box and dragging a slider. Um, yeah, it is different. It's it's it, it's yeah. a slightly different way that it processes it. So. Oh, I didn't even look at it. facial age, so we could age this. I don't want to spend any more time on this. <laughs> but that might be fun to see. Uh, I don't know. Has anybody tried that one? Well, for all those people who are like, make me look younger, make me look skinnier, make me look. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah. Crystal, your children probably don't ask that too often, do you? Make me look <laughs> no, younger. no, no. <laughs> Good. All right. Hey, let's talk about um, some Canon glass for a moment, Crystal. I'm really interested to know what you know. I like this. I, I like this hosting group today. Uh, Crystal, you're a Canon photographer. David, Nikon. I'm Sony most times these days. Yeah, that's a nice little trifecta of all of the kind of popular current mirrorless. Uh, that's I, right. And I can't my um, I can't get away from my Photoshop. It's frozen. Here we go. Okay. So yeah. we've got new um, lenses from Canon, officially announced. What's my easiest way for me to launch those? I think DP Review has them. And just remember, uh, the show notes are linked underneath this video. So if you want to know more about what we're talking about, you can go look. We now have a 70 to 200 f4 and a 518. So, uh, and if you're not paying attention, you might say, well, don't we already have those? And these are for the RF mount. These are for the new mirrorless cameras. Hmm. And I have to say right off the bat, that 70-200 F4, I love its nice compact size and weight. Yeah. Crystal, either of these, are these interesting to you? Um, the 50 is just to like as a placeholder because I'm looking forward to upgrading, but um, I would I have the e, the EF50, but I'm not a huge fan of the the quality, so I would love to try the the 50 out to see how 51. it compares. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So the the 70 to 200 um, is I think it's going to be 1600, and the okay. 50 one eight is going to be 200 dollars. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm wow. pretty sure there's just about every Canon photographer has the original Nifty 50. The Plastic Fantastic is another fun name for it. <laughs> There's actually a couple different versions now. There is that newish one for the EF that was a STM, and it's it's better. Not, not a huge difference. Now, you said it's a placeholder, and that's because I think you said last time you were on the show, you really want that 51 too. Yeah, I fell in love with that <laughs> yeah. when yeah. I rented it, so... Let me, well, that brings up a question that we could talk about a little bit when we talk about the 70 to 200. Um, as primarily a portrait photographer, and this is for both of you, um, Crystal, I'm interested to hear your opinion first. How often are you, if you have that 50 1 2, how often are you shooting at 1 2, or is that not really the point? Um, well, when I rented it, that's I just shot at f1.2 because <laughs> um, at, I love, I love, um, but like blurred backgrounds. Like I just yeah. love for my so subject soft. to pop. So um, I always try to shoot wide open. I think yeah. I've mastered that on all my lenses. So nice. Yeah. I, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. I'm, an, I'm, I'm impressed. Cause I mean, you know, one, two, your, your depth of field is pretty shallow. Mm -hmm. um, 
but you know what you're doing and you're you're nailing those. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It, your your images do have there's a quality to them that uh, it's like immediately if I'm scrolling through Instagram it's like I and it's not just cuz it, it's a lot of pictures of your kids and I've seen mm-hmm. them. It's mm-hmm. just something about like the light, the color. I just, I'm like that's crystal. Like I just know it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um and so but it is tricky. I, I the the photos I did of these four little children a couple weeks ago. Um, I used my fifty one eight that I have not really used a lot. It's my for the Z mount, and I shot at one point eight. I was like, I'm going to do this. I'm just going to try this thing. Had them all lined up, and I was amazed how I did get all of their faces on the same plane of, of focus. And um, I really love the quality of just the the aesthetic of how that looks. It is mm-hmm. very nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I, I, you know, I, um, there, there are certainly benefits to 51 two beyond just having, being able to open at one, two. I mean, mm-hmm. the fact that if you shoot at one, eight, that's uh, so sharp mm-hmm. and very wide yeah. open. And if you put it, the 51 two, uh, what is, did I already say that out loud? I think it's like 2200. Right. It's a, yeah. It's, yeah. These RF lenses are, are not cheap. Um, and you know, the 70 to 200 F four, the the original ef version of that is a very affordable lens that's mm-hmm. somewhere around like 700 dollars oh, wow, or yeah. so yeah and so for this version to be double that price a little bit more than double but here's another question for you so obviously wedding photographers portrait photographers too they love that 70 to 200 f28 yeah. for whatever system they're shooting with that f28 yeah. is lovely um but Honestly, not a huge difference out at 200 between f2.8 and f4, in my opinion. No, you there's not. Agree? You want to fight me on that? It's really, really minimal. Um, <laughs> it's not like worth, you know, losing sleep over. Mm-hmm. But I do like the light gathering at, of 2.8. It's, you know, slightly, you know, gives you more light. Mm-hmm. Um, the new, the new Nikon 70 to 200, I just got in, you know, 2.8, and it's. I'm, I'm in love with that lens. I mean, it's just, it's a focal length that is so useful for me, um, with portraiture. Um, I did all the school photos with it and, um, and I, I'm just finding that a lot of the stuff that I, a lot of the photography I gravitate to, at least the stuff I'm trying to emulate, it tends to look like it's from far back zoomed in. And there's just something about that quality and the compression of it and the, mm-hmm. the bokeh, everything. I just, really love that focal length um and i'm happy to report that the nikon um i don't know about the canon but i would assume it's the same the the nikon 70 to 200 2.8 um it just like the 24 to 70 with the nikon in the z mount it's they're the most prime like zoom lenses i've ever used they just have a color rendition and a sharpness and a thing that feels like you're shooting on a prime and i love that so uh, Crystal, do you own the seventy two hundred f two eight for Canon? I don't. I I did, but I um, it was just too big for me, so oh, yeah. I just a got a prime. Yeah, yeah, it is heavy. Yeah, if you have if you have, uh, I think for wedding photographers, that seventy two hundred is just because you have a bit of flexibility with it. It yeah. is mm-hmm. just almost a must have. In your yeah, life. absolutely. But portrait photographers, where you have a little bit more control over your distance to your subject, you don't have to worry about getting in front of, you know, the guest tables and stuff to get shots. Mm-hmm. I think those primes are, is a nice lightweight way to go. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. The interesting thing about this is it does lo- leave room um, for a 51.4 that might mm-hmm. come out at some point in this RF lineup. But I'm, I'm just really happy to see them. Uh, I know the 7200 is, is still pretty pricey. But it's compact size, and as far as RF lenses go, fairly affordable. And of course, the fifty at two hundred dollars is a very nice affordable lens. Yeah. I feel like Nikon kind of started with that when they first released the Z mount. Some of those mm-hmm. early lenses were very reasonable in price and made it yeah. easy to get into the system. And Canon at first was all about like, look at this twenty-eight to seventy f two lens that's three thousand dollars, and we all were like, that's really cool. Who wants to buy that? Right? Um, yes, there are people who want that, but. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to see them come out with more of these lenses mm-hmm. um, and Definitely. I want even more. So right. we'll have more hands on soon. Um, and uh, but I expect that they are in, in general quite good as many of these RF lenses have been. Yeah, I'm sure they will be. Uh, and let's just do a quick check in, Crystal, with you as an R5 shooter. Has the camera ever overheated on you yet since we last talked? No, not yet. Still <laughs> working not even like seen a, a warning sign. <laughs> nope. <laughs> That's good. 
Yeah. And so um, I did mention uh, in you know in the show notes that the there's a new firmware for the 6R that I haven't tested yet, but Jordan and Chris at DP Review, uh, specifically Jordan who handles on the video side of things, said makes a huge difference in um, how long you can record 4K video for without worrying about overheating. And it also seems like prior to this, it really didn't pay attention to what the temperature was outside the camera. So as mm -hmm. soon as it started to get hot, it was like, I need to shut down. But now it's like, oh, I recognize that it's fairly cool outside the ambient temperature. And so I realize that I probably won't overheat as quick as I think. Mm -hmm. So um, that's something a little bit better mm -hmm. to think about. All right. And then um, I lost the show notes. What else was I going to mention and talk about? Oh, I want to show these Pano Awards. So this is a um, contest put on by Epson and a bunch of other um, companies down here. Nikon is a sponsor, Epson and uh, Haida Filters and some others. They're called the, the Pano Awards. But what I like about them, one of the things that struck me is one, beautiful images that I think are always worth kind of looking at for inspiration. But two, um, they don't necessarily strike me as these gigantic panorama size images at mm -hmm. first. Um, and I think that is a good example of there are reasons to shoot panos, but you don't always, people always ask me when we're out in the field and we're teaching, like, how many images should you shoot in a pano? And I usually say, like, four or five. Beyond yeah. that, you just kind of start to end up with this really thin, wide, what do you do with it shot. Yeah. Right? So yeah. let's take just a moment and look at the 2020 winners galleries. Uh, first, one, you've seen some of these sliding by. This first one um, it very clearly doesn't feel like a pano shot. And just the simplicity of this and how much power is in a simple shot like this. The snow texture is just fantastic. So... Mm. These are linked in the show notes. I also linked, I meant to talk about it last week, but we didn't get to it, um, some awesome macro photos as well. So we had Tanya on, and we were talking about her macro photos. There was a macro photography contest, and that's linked last week. Yeah. So this is interesting to me because let's, can, how do I see this bigger? I thought it was just going to come up bigger here. Hmm. Um, this is an aerial shot, and so I'm not sure how much pano is in this. But this is another way to be, you know, a visually arresting shot is just, it's hard to tell what's going on. Mm -hmm. But if you look carefully, it's called mm -hmm. mine waste. And if you look carefully, I'm pretty sure that's like some gigantic piece of um, machinery, like a dump truck or a bulldozer or something. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're, we're looking at this, a big pond uh, of mine waste, some kind of runoff and a road uh, and just, you know... One way to set your work aside, I feel like, is to c capture something in a way that you have to stop and try to figure it out. It, yeah. It's almost true with this one right here. I think it takes you a moment to figure out that that's the top of, of a little tree or a branch or something poking out of snow. Mm, that's interesting. So. Wow. And then this is just a, a fantastic um, work. This reminds me a lot of, I can't remember her name. She had taken a class from the McKays early on, and now she... Uh, is, a, is a sponsored Hasselblad photographer and does a lot of really clean architecture. But just this long exposure. I'm going to guess that it's uh, an, an upwards pano, but I don't mm -hmm. know that for sure. So meaning that they photograph multiple shots up. Hmm. Wow. So Pretty just nice. some really, really beautiful work in here. And again, simple, simple, simple. Yeah. I feel like. In Absolutely. A lot of these cases, there's not a lot going on. Yeah, that that bottom right, or I mean, that that image on the right, uh, black and white, is just fantastic. Okay. It's really mm -hmm. nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, and let's see. Hmm. I keep losing my notes. I think we're gonna start wrapping up. What else do we need to talk about? Is there something else I'm forgetting? Oh, <sighs> well, I'm supposed to know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Well, there's a lot of stuff to talk about. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I think. Oh, oh, I know. The what do we want to see under the Christmas tree oh, or yeah, from a holiday presents, uh, whatever holiday, or 
you know, I really made this open ended. Or sure. what do you want to see released by whoever you're shooting with next year? Uh, in the next year, hmm. um, Crystal, I think I know what you're going to say. I think you already talked about it. But <laughs> yes. is, anything else you want to say? Um, well, what I'd like to see from Canon is what they're continuing to do is more affordable lenses and also um, like replacing all the popular EF lenses, like the 35, the 24, like all those popular lenses so, for the RF mount. So, and the 135, like the ancient lenses. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So um, remind me what you, you have now, what you shoot with uh, lens wise now. You've got the, the Canon R5 and then yeah. what lenses are you shooting with that? So I shoot with um, Tamron 35 mostly and um, I have the Sigma 24 and also the Tamron 85. So I'm shooting with all third party mostly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So to, yeah. That's why I want that 50 so I can have my, like, you know, RF. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So. Yeah. 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 You'll get and it. And then, and have you have you shot with the one thirty five before? That's a, is that the one thirty five f two? Yes, yes. Yeah. I used to. Yeah, I shot it maybe a few years ago, and I really love like um, the the character of it. Like when you shoot, I just love that f two. So yeah. I would pick that up if they had an RF version. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's nice. Yeah. I, well, it'd be interesting to see. I know there's some leaked roadmaps out there for mm -hmm. the coming year. Um, with RF on it uh, and the 51 too that we, we've been mentioning mm -hmm. in the show. That is out already, mm -hmm. um, but is expensive. Right. <laughs> what, let's, uh, if they came out with a 51.4 that was $1,000, would you take that or would you hold out for the 1.2? Um, I think I would take that because I, that's all my lenses that I shoot with are 1.4 except for the Tamron 85. So I'm used to shooting at that um, F stop. So I would take okay. that. Yeah. David Carr, what are you? What, what, what would you like to add to your system or what would you like to see Nikon come out with over this next year? Well, they just released the 14 to 24 2.8 for the Z mount. Um, looks fantastic and I would love it, but it is very pricey. Um, and I've spent enough money on lenses this year. <laughs> so, and I'm pretty happy with my 14 to 30. It's, it's an F4, but it, it, it serves me very well. Um, but yeah, I would love to see that under the Christmas tree, the 14 to 24. And, um, you know, or, or a Hasselblad or something like that, you know, something just a whole different thing. But um, I'm really looking forward to Nikon releasing for the Z mount uh, some of the telephoto primes, like a, like a 400 millimeter 2.8 or, you know, a have got the 500 5.6, something along those lines, I think would be awesome. I'm not uh, hesitant to use the FTZ adapter, mm -hmm. but let's face it, it's nice when you just can skip that extra element and just kind of go just native all the way through mm -hmm. from the, from the camera body to the lens and that stuff will come out. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah, I can't, I can't wait to see more and more of those things be released. Mm -hmm. nice. I would yep. say. Yeah. Good. I, you know, I asked this question. I, I mean, uh, I'd always love the next greatest thing to play with, but I, I, for me personally, I'm still pretty happy with my Sony a seven, R3, that's the older one now, and the Tamron lenses. The thing that I need, that I'd like to see under my tree this year is a, is a lens that I own, that I'm not on loan or renting for shooting the stars that I'm really happy with. That could mm. be the Sigma 14 to 24 F2.8, or that could be Sony's 20 millimeter F1.8. So one of those two sure. I will be picking up sometime soon. You know, as as we've had a lot of moving these workshops around and I've had a little bit more time to shoot the stars. I just really realize how much I love that and how I really do want a lens dedicated to that. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, that'd be in, nice. In, yeah. In 2021, I'm really excited to see these rumored cameras come out. Um, we, we've got an A9 Mark III that's being rumored that mm. should be released at the beginning of the year. Maybe yeah. as early as CES, which I, have they said CES isn't happening in person, is it? I don't know. I can't imagine that it would. Yeah, I can't either. It kind of seems um, like next year is going to be off, you know, like another off year when it comes to that stuff. It, it, yeah. At least the first it. six months or so. I don't know. Yeah. But. Yep. Um, I have a fly that's made its way down here now. And um, 
so, but the, I'm, I'm excited to see how that is. It's rumored to be like 50 megapixels, but still have that crazy fast autofocus and burst rate, which is kind of similar to what Nikon's been hinting at at a, at a higher. Yeah, camera. that's that's the rumor. Um, I'm not, you know, it's funny because you mentioned the whole high resolution camera thing. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just not clamoring for more resolution at this point. I'm, uh, it, it, I mean, I, it's great. I just, it would be great if, if the software like Lightroom could, could handle it. I mean, <laughs> we'd all love it. You know, who cares how, what the resolution is, but it's when those file sizes get so big that, it, that they just become like, you know, trying to push a grand piano around, you know, digitally. It's like, it's just really unwieldy and it's hard to, have a workflow when you're waiting on that stuff. And when I rented the, you know, the, the a seven, uh, what was it? The, um, the R four, sorry. Um, last year, you know, uh, for, uh, well, earlier this year for Yellowstone, I mean, I love the, the body, the, the feel of it, man, those files took forever to load. I couldn't believe how long they took to load. Yeah. And, uh, that's just a hard thing to do when you're, when you're, especially when you're like running a gun and at a wedding or something, you want to back up some, some, some cards. It's just very, it's time consuming. Yeah. Yep. The, 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 the systems aren't there yet to support those kind of bigger megapixels, but they, they're pushing them at us and it'll be interesting to see, you know, how that shows up next year. Yeah. 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 Um, all right, let's move on to our Q and a, we're going to start to wrap this show up. Kevin wants to know, how do we set up Lightroom and Photoshop to make sure that we're working and applying photos in 16 bit as recommended by Jeff from PPA? Um, yeah, I don't know. That's I'm stumped by that because Jeff did mention that in that in in our discussion, but I don't. I, I when you, I even went into Photoshop to try to figure it out. And I don't. That stuff is like it's beyond me. I don't. I don't really know. <laughs> uh, here in Photoshop, uh, this was that image that I right clicked in Lightroom and said open in Photoshop for editing. I believe the default is 16 bit. So. Okay. I think, I think it is. Yeah, Kevin, you're you're just good to go, mm -hmm. um, and but you could check to make sure. Open up an image, check its mode under image mode, and then the bits per channel. And okay, you should be good to go. Well, Every I've done that before. But switched. I've done that before, but I didn't realize. I thought maybe Jeff was referring to something where like it's an automatic, like I don't know, something within the preferences. But um, I've looked at the the bit rate on the images and i guess you're right i think it does it does default at 16. yeah and let's just make sure so in preferences of lightroom if we go to external editing aha uh -huh, file format what so what file format you want and then you can choose a bit depth and you just want to make sure i think again i believe 16 bit is the default i've certainly never changed it and um that lets you uh, it doesn't even offer 32. Does it offer 30? No, 16 or eight. And so, yeah, mm -hmm. you want 16 to make sure you're transferring as much information as possible there. All right. Good question, Kevin. Laurie wants our, our opinions to know. This is a great question. Um, we mentioned it briefly last show. Uh, didn't use it at all in this show. What are our opinions on the new color grading tool? Crystal, have you played with it much? Let's, let me open I've up. I've played this. with it, but I'm not very good at using it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I still got some work to do on that. Yeah. So uh, Laurie's asking about down here, we have the color grading panel, which by the way, is taking a place. It's not, a, uh, it's taking the place of the split toning panel, which most of the time when I ask people, you know, did you use split toning? The answer is no. There are some people who are like, yeah, I love it. You can yeah. do everything with, with uh, color grading that you can. Um, so David Carr, have you tried playing with it at all in recent shoots? Uh, yeah, I have actually. And um, it, it, it worked really well. Um, it just, just being able to, you know, move the, the around in, in those circles and, and watch the image kind of change and see what's happening in the shadows and the highlights. I don't really look at it from a mathematical standpoint, and I'm not even really looking at what I'm changing. I'm just looking at how it's affecting the image. And I was able to take some green cast away from a few images, still having green where I needed it, but I didn't want green to be dominating like skin tones and things like that. I wanted the, I, I wanted green to be present where it needed to be without being overwhelming. And so it definitely helped with that. And I've used split toning in the past and uh, you know, for certain images and I, I really loved what it was able to do, but it's a tricky thing to kind of get used to. Maybe this will be a little easier. Yeah. I love that you mentioned kind of removing skin, uh, uh, you know, color cast. I think that's an often overlooked uh, you know, use of these tools, both split toning in this, in that yeah. let's say, for instance, you felt like here and, and always uh, 
double click on the word at the top it will reset everything so let's say for instance i feel like her dress maybe is a little on the yellow side mm -hmm. so i can pull down towards the blue to try to remove that yellow cast so i'm not really I am adding blue, but another way to think of it is removing the yellow. Yeah, and Once you're you... removing it only in certain within a certain brightness of the image. You know, the shadows, the the midtones, the highlights. So that's right. That's, that's a right. pretty important thing. I mean, you know, sometimes when we're when we're shooting, we we capture the light is perfect, the colors are perfect, and yeah. you just don't need to do any of this. But there are a lot of times where because shadow and and light your camera's only going to the white balance can only adjust for one of those completely you know accurately and so sometimes like the color you'll you'll look at an image you'll be like I just can't figure out what it is I don't like about it and it's the colors there's just mm -hmm. something about the spectrum's not right between highlights and shadows and I love being able to fine tune that but it can be a pandora's box and you can spend a lot of time second guessing yourself so so just when you start to move these, you get the little nub that there, it's there uh, prior, but you can then kind of precisely drag it to the color you want, and then mm -hmm. you can grab the inner circle. Uh, it'll lock to that. So now I'm until yeah. you move it a, a significant amount. So there's there's kind of all these smaller little controls to that. And if you want to see any one of them larger, let's say I want to talk work on the midtones, I click just the midtones, and mm -hmm. then there it is. Can I click right and it will just yeah so you can then kind of just cycle through the uh, different ones there yeah um, and then the amount of blending that you do as well I, I'm I, I'm excited about it I haven't used it a ton I haven't been processing too many pictures since the last update but um, I see myself using this way way more than I ever used split toning and I think it's got some nice power absolutely yeah, I agree yeah video folks are really excited because this is for most good video editing applications, this is very similar. So now to have something that feels similar, they're like, oh, I understand how to work that. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. All right. Um, Pam, email me your question. You, you, can I delete ACC and start anew with Lightroom and Photoshop? Can't get what I have to upload properly. Let's work together, Pam. We'll figure that out. <laughs> D Diane uh, wants to know from you, David, what is the name of the Z case you have, the one with the Arca plate built into it? Yeah, you yeah, I, that on well, a story? Yeah, I actually answered it. Well, I would get my camera, cameras, but they're uh, locked away in this little thing. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to go get the key. But um, um, but it's called Limbs Design, I think, L-I-M-S or Z. But it's I think it was like a Amazon thing or... I'm pretty sure it was, but one of our clients on, on a McKay tour last year had one on his Z7. I really liked it. It was just a nice leather half case with an Arca Swiss mount built into it. So it's nice if you set your camera down, you don't scratch up the bottom of your camera. It, you know, if you're ever thinking about resale value, it really protects the body very nicely and gives you the built-in uh, grip, uh, the built-in grip and the built-in uh, uh, mount adapter. So, and they have a few different colors, very, very well built uh, product, and they're about a hundred bucks. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and then Emmanuel wants to know from you, Crystal, please, between the Tamron 3514 and the Sigma 3514 art, which is the sharpest? Did you ever make careful comparisons? Um, I've never, I don't think I've ever used this. No, I've never used the Sigma. I stayed away from it because I heard so so many like not so good stories about it. So I just went straight for the Tamron. The Tamron ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I haven't compared those either. I think they're very, very similar. Mm -hmm. Like you, um, w uh, you know, my partner had the 35 art for Canon way back. And mm -hmm. it was the only art lens that we ever had any autofocus issues with. I don't know what it was about that one. Mm -hmm. I, and we had we heard that we're one mm -hmm. of the only ones. Um, I think they are very, very similar. Mm -hmm. but that the Tamron newer seems to have less issues than the 35 art. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. And Trilina wants to know, last question, how is what we were just looking at the color grading different than the RGB in the tone curve panel? Um, and I'm going to say really very, very little. It's just a different way to approach it. You have those yeah. additional controls. So like here, if I come in here, now I can control the amount of red um, in the shadows, in the highlights region, but you're limited within that to that color range, kind of like from red to green to blue. Whereas in here, you've got a much more precise and kind of the full gamut and your ability to control it plus the amount of blending 
and the balance there. So it's there are a lot of similarities and overlaps, but the color grading gives you just just a little bit more to deal well, with. Well, and the, the nice thing about it, I don't know if I mean this is kind of an audio thing, but like uh, if you've ever looked at a graphic equalizer that has like all the little sliders, there'd be like you know thirty sliders that you can adjust the sound. You could even you can go in and like adjust each one. And or, you know, if you see a, a graphic equalizer like on an audio uh, device on your computer or something, you can pull down just the mid range. You can bring up just the highs and it does these movements. And I think the color grading tool is cool because it 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 kind of can move a lot of colors at, at one time. It can kind of like move a range. And so you while you're doing that, you're actually watching the image and you can really fine tune it. Um, in a in a way that's very real time instead of like okay i'm gonna grab the yellow slider here and then i'm gonna grab the so but it's you're right i think it's just another way at arriving at that but i'm pretty excited about it cool good yeah me too me too good question Shalina. all right and that's it that's all of those uh questions hey everybody thanks so much for watching and crystal and david thank you guys let me bring up uh, thank you if you don't already follow end. crystal Please follow Crystal Weir Photography. It's linked right down below this video. Not only for her fantastic photography, but her adorable children as well. Yes. <laughs> um, so definitely worth your follow. And that's a nice way for you to thank yeah. them for giving their time and expertise on this show. And of course, David. David Carr underscore photo on Instagram as well. And other social medias are linked down below. And if you're watching right. this and you haven't already giving it a thumbs up. That's really appreciated too. That's an easy way to thank all of us for our time. Yeah. All right. So until next time, when maybe next week we'll actually know who the president of the United States is. <laughs> maybe. Or maybe. <laughs> hey, we made it through the show without any, any talking. That's and, good. You know, that's good. so that's good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay, Crystal and David, thanks so much. Thank you. And See thanks all of you. Soon. Thank you. And thank you, chat room, for hanging out with us. Bye-bye.